Oh, I get it. I get it. Thanks. Yes. My fellow Rotarians, whoop. My fellow Rotarians, it's high noon and would love to get the meeting started. To lead us in the prayer and the four way test, Gary Grice. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for this day, for the gift of life, for the privilege to live in this country, for your creation of us and for all that you have done. We thank you for Rotary and for all that it does in the world. We just pray that uh, you would intervene in this uh, worldwide crisis that we have with COVID. We pray especially for the people of India and thank you for the relief that is coming their way. And we just pray for more. Bless this food, our beating, our speaker, uh, and give us a good day today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four way test of the things we think, say, or do first. Is it the truth? The truth. Is it fair? Fatal concern. Third. Will it build comfort and benefit? Fourth. Be beneficial concern. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. To give us our wonderful Sergeant of Arms report, Sean, would you please come forward after that uh, Reds game yesterday? Thank you, Dwayne. The, um, yesterday, the Cincinnati Reds won a nail biter, 13 to 12. Uh, thankfully, uh, Don Boland's Cubs were serving up some nice down the middle balls for us to uh, knock out of the yard. So we had a really good thing. Uh, the Cincinnati Bengals draft occurred last week. Uh, they drafted uh, over 2,000 pounds of men to play in the next coming years. So we're glad to see how that works out. We don't know what uh, we are gonna get price per pound as it comes, but we'll see uh, all about that. And uh, FC Cincinnati had a big open house, ribbon cutting for all you soccer fans out there. Their first home game is May 16th and uh, they have yet to score a goal this year. So in, right in tune with all the Cincinnati sports. That's all I have, right, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We do have a few guests. Jacob, could you please come up and introduce your guest? Good afternoon. Um, pleasure to be with you with everyone today. Uh, so we've got a couple of guests uh, with me here. I'll uh, start by introducing uh, Abigail Martin. Uh, Abigail is one of our rock star camp counselors out at YMCA Camp Ernst, uh, former Peace Corps participant, and um, she is applying or looking for a club to sponsor her. She is uh, for the uh, Rotary Peace Fellowship. So, um, Abby, you want to come up and just talk a little bit about yourself real quick? Thank you. Uh, it's so nice to be here with you all today. I was affiliated actually with Rotary sort of loosely in high school through an Interact Club. I was a founding member at my high school. Um, and, oh, thank you. 
And uh, as was just mentioned, I served in the Peace Corps and actually one of the regional capitals near us had a plaza that had been built by Rotary. So every time I passed by, um, I had such wonderful reminders of the work that Rotary does. Um, but to share a little bit about myself, since I am here to look for sponsorship for this fellowship, um, I, I grew up in the area, went to St. Thomas School in Fort Thomas for grade school, and then Notre Dame Academy for high school. Um, and I grew up working out at Camp Ernst during the summers, which was sort of actually one of the ways that I started in involvement in the community. I, after high school, went to DePaul University in Indiana, where I earned a dual degree, Bachelor of Music in voice performance. So I studied opera and classical music and Bachelor of Arts with a double major in peace and conflict studies and religious studies. So I completed four capstone projects and graduated Phi Beta Kappa, Summa Cum Laude um, with the Murad Medal, which was our university's recognition for the senior who had the most significant scholarly and artistic accomplishments during their time at DePauw. Uh, after that, I joined the Peace Corps and served in Togo, was unfortunately evacuated due to COVID. Um, but when I came back, I jumped right back into working with the Y in a program they were developing last summer to help reach students, uh, kids who were lacking social contact, who were struggling with uh, the challenges of learning in a pandemic environment. And so we did a five week curriculum with them uh, throughout the summer. And then my alma mater ended up with a pandemic related vacancy with a week to go before school started. So I've been teaching English and language arts out in Fort Thomas since then. Um, and I'm hoping at the end of next school year to be able to set that up for a transition into the next teacher um, so that they are set up for success in the years to come. And I'm hoping to move on to graduate school, which had always been my intention. Um, to study peace and development with the aim of working in education and youth development related uh, international non-governmental organizations um, and working to as a program management, monitoring and evaluation, those kinds of things, so that to continue to advance and learn from um, how we can best do that work, how we can best serve the students of the world, um, and especially the young people who are our future, as is perhaps cliche, but definitely true. Um, so it's an honor to be here with you all today. I do have copies of my resume and bio if any of you would like to take a look at those. And I'm very grateful for you welcoming me into your midst this afternoon. All right, thanks, Abby. Uh, next, I've got uh, Justin Austin. Uh, Justin is uh, uh, works with USI or works for USI Insurance and. Uh, Union resident and also recently uh, a new RC Dura YMCA board member. Uh, Justin and I got connected on LinkedIn uh, because he wanted to get more involved in the community. And so that's how we were able to connect into the Y and uh, just, you know, had the opportunity to get to know Justin over the past few months and uh, recommended that he uh, uh, ought to make a visit to uh, our Rotary Club. So, Justin, welcome. Tough act to follow there with Abigail. So <laughs> great, great job for you and everything you're doing to give back. Um, as Jacob said, Justin Austin, uh, Vice President of Transportation and Logistics at USI Insurance Services. I've only been there a little over three months. Uh, I came from TQL, Total Quality Logistics, where I was there for seven years um, as a top broker and then moved into management. Um, most recently, I head up everything from Mexico for the organization and then made the switch um, here over the holidays to USI to head up their transportation practice through a, a good family friend that they were looking to expand um, here locally in that space. Um, learning insurance, so that's been fun and fun and boring at the same time, as we know from the insurance world. Um, married, um, I was a nurse practitioner for St. Elizabeth. Uh, two kids, a three-year-old and one-year-old, Finley and Clay. Uh, graduated from Moorhead State University in 2010. Um, and then got my MBA from Thomas More University um, in 2019. Um, that's really that's really it. Um, not anything too too glamorous there. Looking to get back, join the join the board on the Y. Um, also a mentor over at DCCH Children's Home of Fort Mitchell, um, and really just kind of looking to get back now that I'm kind of in that next step. My wife and I are in kind of our next step of our careers and able to start giving back to the community a little bit more. So 
that's really my story. I appreciate you guys having me out. Appreciate you guys taking a few moments and introducing yourself. We have a very dynamic speaker today. And one of my goals of being president next year is set up a mentor program with the high school. Talked with the principal and he says, one of the things that keeps me up at night, I'm gonna have 70 kids that are not gonna graduate this year. And I'm like, 70 kids out of Ignite? He said, yes, they're not gonna be able to, they're just not gonna graduate. And if we can make a kids a, a difference in those kids' lives, I mean, I think that'll take this club to a next level. To introduce our speaker today, Julia Pop. So I'm actually gonna tag on to what Dwayne just said about the kids not graduating. Um, so those kids are probably some of our most at-risk kids and our very most at-risk kids attend our school, um, Rise Academy which many of you don't know that used to be our, um, our alternative school. And I met Dr. Joe Hibbets, gosh, probably a few years ago and just was taken in by his passion, not only for the kids, but those kids are coming from at-risk families. And so we need to really pull not only the kids, but the families up to be a part of our community. Um, Joe just amazes me. He, how many miles a week do you run, Joe? 80 miles a week does mar trail mar marathons, which are different than regular marathons. And just through his perseverance is just a complete inspiration. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Joe Hibbett. Stop my screen. Yep. <laughs> Sure. As she, uh, as Ms. Pyle brings up my uh, PowerPoint, I have 22 slides. And I'm going to keep it down to 20 minutes. Um, and I'm not good enough to do one minute per slide or that. So I'm going to skip over some. Um, do you want to try? I think, I think I'll be all right. Does everyone, can everyone hear me? And I'll speak into the mic a little bit. Yeah, do the mic. Okay. My dad, some of you may know, I think for sure, uh, Mike Hibbett, um, the Hibbett family. Um, we've been in, uh, I was born in Florence, lived in Florence my entire life. And service above self inspires me uh, with the Florence Rotary Club. That's, that's to my core. Um, so I've been a New County person um, since I can remember. Uh, so went to Yale Elementary, Went to Boo, uh, Connor Middle School. My dad was the principal there. Um, Larry Ryle was the uh, superintendent uh, who hired my dad into the administration. Um, and his heart for students led over to my dad's attitude towards students. And so I, you know, I follow his footsteps, so to speak. Uh, I'm going to put this back here and I'm going to click through these slides as quick and as efficient as I can. Jefferson and John Dewey uh, always posited that, um, that the question is not, does our edu public education create a um, public? It does. So then the, therefore the question is, well then what type of public are we creating? And, you know, it's to no shock uh, with our political turmoil and not to get political, um, we can see that, man, I think a lot of us have struggled in civics and our civics courses in, uh, in history and in social, in social studies. Are we creating a public that is, you know, so um, self-consumed with egocentrism and, uh, and consumerism where, we want our students to go and be, go to these AP classes and then go to you know, the epitome of educational institutions like Harvard and Yale and invest into their own lives and just keep dumping into their own lives without giving back to the community, which is great about this um, organization. 
Where are we creating a public where we're indifferent and uh, polarize ourselves with our own viewpoints and attitudes, not, uh, not connecting to others despite differences? And I think as a public, we struggle with that right now. And uh, it's pretty apparent. Alternative schools have a, a pretty negative stereotype. I don't know if any of you have ever, when you hear the word alternative school, you know, that first assumption that comes into your mind is probably one of punitive placements that mimic a penal system that, like that of the Boone County Jail or Eddyville State Penitentiary. And, and they were created um, largely in part because of uh, zero tolerance policies that dealt with drugs and weapons, students bringing these into the schools. And without going into detail of how that, how that was, um, when that trend started, these alternative schools started popping up all across America. And they started facing a lot of lawsuits because the lawsuits were saying uh, school to prison pipeline. What type of public are we creating? So how do we get to a, a place where students are sent for punitive reasons? And in our, our uh, Florence, right before COVID, our parade, uh, this float our students created, um, won first place at that parade. We were also in the Red Day Parade. Um, and, and won a best in show there and in Augusta's uh, Christmas parade. Would, they would do floats like this, projects like this. How do these kids go from zeros in our educational system to heroes? It's a transformation from uh, punitive justice, like you deserve this because you've done this, to restorative justice, because we have to remember they're still children. So, the RISE Academy represents Boone County Schools um, in this endeavor to take critically at risk students and give them hope again, give them an identity. But you'll find that alternative schools mimic or small, uh, you know, a micro size of what state uh, and, and incarceration institutions are in Kentucky. These are just in quotes just recently in April published um, by Lexington Herald and the Louisville Cour uh, Cour Courier Journal. Headlines, Kentucky prisons are draining the state budget to the point where if we just reduced 1,000 prisoners, that would save the state $12 million. Kentucky state incarceration rate among the highest in the entire country. They project, uh, and I rounded this up, to $688 million over 10 years for the Kentucky corrections budget of an increase. Uh, this year, it's 115 million that they had to um, increase it to. So this is crazy when you think about this point. It costs $37,000 per day. I mean, I'm sorry, per year um, in the state prison system for an inmate. The Kentucky, in Kentucky, we spend $8,000 per student per year on an education. The data shows this, that you have to spend more money on at-risk students than regular students. What that means is you either pay now as a society or you're gonna pay a, a heck of a lot more later. So I just, I know probably, you know, being here from Kentucky, I think uh, our, our boy here, uh, Nick Saban, uh, sums this up pretty good. You know, there, there's always a lot of criticism out there. When somebody does something wrong, everybody wants to know, how you going to punish the guy? But there's not a lot for a 19-year-old kid, people out there saying, why don't you give them another chance? Like, so I'm going to get a speech right now. Where do you want to be? God makes a mistake. Well, well, where do you want to be? You want to be in the street? Or do you want to be here in residence? You know, when I was over there at the university, we 
Punitive or restorative? Do we want to condemn the children of Boone County to an education system that polarizes them because of behavioral issues, because of um, stressors that they've incurred in their lives? All behavior is a form of communication. I know this is kind of blurry, but by the numbers, I know we were talking about 70 students that were going to graduate this year. I was I had the privilege of working with uh, Principal Gales. He was actually the principal at the alternative school, um, Rise Academy. And we created this virtual school where um, we've graduated the last three years, 160 students each year that would have never graduated. And you, you do the, the math on that to be productive citizens, you make a million more dollars in your lifetime with just a high school diploma. And it's more important than that, what we're trying to do is build their self-confidence so that it creates a small momentum. You see, it's not about algebra two and getting an A or getting a passing grade, it's about that sense of completion in those courses so that you can complete more things when times get rough. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. Uh, probably about pretty good, okay. We were on to something. This is just a quick picture. I'm gonna move quickly now. This young lady here in the front, if you can see in the, in some, in the wheelchair, was um, had a degenerative disease and she has since passed away. But we traveled all the way up to Michigan and built this, you can see this crooked tiny playhouse. You look at those faces, those young men there, each one of those young men um, were sent to the alternative school for punitive reasons. Punitive reasons to punish them. And I'm and, and there's a you know philosophy behind that that I'm in the middle of the road with, and I'm not saying that that's wrong. But I just want you to know that in Boone County. We, tr we try to create a story behind each and every one of these students to where they give service above self, where they're self-aware enough to give service above self. They're so focused on themselves and their problems, and we flip the script on that to get them to own their problems, to have a tough mindset. Because the, most, the reality is most students in Boone County don't go through what these kids have gone through. So they either have this victim mindset where, oh, it's, every, it's the world versus me, and that turns into anger and bitterness, or they get the service mindset where what has happened to me I, is now part of my story, and I'm growing because of that. And I'm more tough and more mature than most, most of America if they're able to get to that mindset, and that's our job. I'm not gonna go into this. This is kind of like a survey of literature, but I, I would say that it started with this book, The Deepest Well, 
And you learn that these adverse childhood experiences, there's 10 of them, that the CDC says. These 10 experiences, you either answer, yes, this happened to me on or before my 18th birthday, or no, this didn't happen to me. It ranges from sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, substance abuse, suicides committed in the home, is a parent been incarcerated or not? Okay, those are just some of the questions and these kids will answer yes or no. 86% of everyone who goes to the RISE Academy answers seven or higher on that. If you just answer um, four questions right, just four, you're 32.6 times more likely to have educational issues. And our students in Boone County in Florence, 86% who come to, my, to come to our building answer seven or higher. That means this, you're less likely to live a long life. You're more likely to die before you're 30. I think they say 32. And so when we talk about poverty, we're talking about poverty of the mind. Not just, you know, we, we, we face these physical barriers that the, that the CDC says call adverse childhood experiences. But then they affect your mind so that your mind is like that of a, a soldier who's been over in, a, in Iraq or, or in war. The same type of PTSD happens to children. And so when they interact with society, they're disconnected. Our goal is to reconnect. In Kentucky, you know, for the third year in a row, gentlemen and ladies, third year in a row, we have the highest rate of child victims and abuse. Third year in a row. That's double the rate of the national average. And it results in trauma. Our students come to us with this, that loneliness is more dangerous and causes uh, the same effects as an obesity and a smoking cigarettes, 15, 15 cigarettes a day. Sorry, I can't read the whole quote because of this little thing up there. 15 cigarettes a day is the same as loneliness and depression that that has on the mind. So if you're a kid and you, and you have score seven out of 10 on the ACE childhood, how lonely are you gonna be at a, at a public school where we um, look at your deficits and try to make up the gap and the difference? You're pretty lonely, you're pretty disconnected. We, our philosophy is, you know, you'll, you'll hear, well, kids, kids will do well if they want to, as if they have a choice. We look at it much deeper and we say kids do well if they can. Our students don't have the skill set to be successful unless there's an intervention. And that's what the RISE Academy does. Here's a graduation rate just with, you know, this goes up to 2018, 2019. I haven't updated the slide. But the last three years, like I said, 160, we graduated 161 last year. We'll be graduating over 175 this year. And it increased the district's graduation rate by 9% up to 98%. We talk about prison costs, we got to talk about health care costs. 50% of the children in Kentucky are on Medicaid. 50%. One in three Kentuckians are on Medicaid. And you see in Northern Kentucky, we live under this facade of $78,000 is the median household income, in Kentucky, which is 15,000 or probably 16,000 if I round it up, dollars higher than the national average. And so, you know, the, we, we're kind of isolated as a suburb of Cincinnati. I understand we have a lot of opportunities and jobs, but I'm telling you that, um, that I, 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 I'm with, I work with families every day, every day that, that don't even know where they're going to get their food. And that just sounds crazy. How is that even possible? And we expect that kid to learn. So we've created this elaborate system, um, a very intentional, 
look, you can't relationship your way to a great education for these students. That's a big part of it. But we also are, are really focusing on their ability to read. My daughter who's uh, in the um, fourth grade can write and read better than most of my students who are in high school. It's crazy. Um, some of the key features of our programming, um, other than personalization, the big push next year is adult connection and education for families. I'm trying to uh, put before the Board of it, uh, Ed in Boone County an approval to where we can start educating their parents and that parents will start receiving their high school diplomas um, under certain uh, profiles because most of the parents of my students do not. So what a great way to, re uh, to encourage them. The, uh, I think it's appropriate with two things to end. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Frederick Doug Douglass obviously said that. And I just talked to you about the, you know, the penal institution and, and all that and, and Kentucky state of affairs, but, you know, we're one of the seven poorest states in the country. It's not to beat down and feel bad that we're Kentuckians, but it's, I wish everyone had your all's attitude where it's service above self, that we're not creating a public that's just self-consumed with our consumerism and materialistic world. The last thing, I, I, we flip rigor backwards. So I spelled rigor backwards intentionally. Rigor in educational circles, we'll talk about that. Well, that student is graduated, but is their curriculum rigorous enough? Did, did they really understand the concepts of math and, and uh, English? And I say this for my students, that when educators look at you and, and say rigor to at-risk students, I tell them to tell, tell them about your lives of abuse, homelessness, abandonment, that you have to go to work full time for, to support your parents with no transportation, but you find a way to get there while possibly being pregnant. You have barely enough to eat and then ask them to solve that problem every day like you've done and still graduated. There's this girl, her name's KK. I'll end with this story. And I apologize for going over just a little bit. KK came to me, she scored a nine out of 10 on the adverse childhood experience. Meaning she had that much amount of trauma in her life where she couldn't function in society. You tell her to do something, it's gonna be an argument. She's gonna cuss you out, become violent, whatever. And we were able to make her be able to be self-aware of her own life where she started making small changes. She teachers usually feel good about themselves when you stand up here and you guys are participating, you're making eye contact with me, you're raising your hand, giving me you know, comments, questioning, discussions going on. Not with these students. This took a, this was a, a five year journey with this young lady to the point she graduated early. She got her um, phlebotomy certification. So she started taking blood for St. E. And then she was so good at it that she put her resume on LinkedIn. We taught her how to do that. Uh, she drives every day down to Lexington because they pay her so much more than St. E does. Um, and, she, and she's a phlebotomist down there and she's working with Gateway currently to get her LPN. Now I can give you stories like that all the time. You know, we've, I know the prayer this beginning, but at our school, we become all things to all boys and girls that we may be able to save a few. And I'm just trying to, I hope I've done a good job on their sake of bringing an awareness to their journey to you all. Um, uh, that's our journey at RISE. And next year, we're going to be a lot more PR savvy and, and, and getting people involved. We need people to be involved. It takes about seven adult relationships that are positive for a student 
that's critically at risk, that's continual in their life to be successful. And I have a staff that's amazing that does that every day, day in and day out. Um, so I thank them and I thank you guys for allowing me to take a few moments of your time and I hope it was worthwhile. Thank you. I should ask any, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. All right, first of all, you're the coolest educational talk I've ever met. <laughs> yeah. So, Thanks. Uh, if there's volunteer mentorship opportunities, my wife actually works in the school system and that has a, and we'd love to be involved if there's a way that outside volunteers can help mentor and help to the success of the program. Yeah, so, um, so the, the question was, um, if there are mentorships, um, how do we get involved, essentially? And that um, we have not formalized that process yet. That is one of our big pushes this summer that myself and the leadership team are doing, is to create a sign-up form uh, connected to our website. And we have a social worker um, that's employed with us that she will be heading that up along with her vice principal. There will be... Um, communication, obviously, through Ms. Pyle, and uh, we will definitely make sure we get that out. But I appreciate your willingness to be involved. Yeah, Mr. Wilfenhoff. Uh, mental health is our number one challenge as far as working with students. Um, the, the amount of trauma that they've incurred um, you know, I, I know we were speaking to uh, that Jordan Dallas, an attorney, is going to be speaking about human trafficking soon um, here. Um, I have a lot of boys in particular who've been sexually abused. Um, and so that you, you can imagine the, the effect on the mind on, you know, that that has. I would say the second challenge is just bringing an awareness and formalizing our program. We went and visited during COVID three programs across the state that we are benchmarking ourselves against um, to improve our program and to really formalize things like mentorships and a community involvement. Um, and as far as a system and a, and a process, how we become more successful with these students. Um, so that takes more money, takes more staff positions at our school. For example, one of the premier programs in Jessamine County has 32 staff members and they work with 150 students a year. We have 10 and we work, uh, we work with last year, we were gonna get close to 300 students. So edu alternative education is easy to overlook in an edu because it's just not something we think of education, we think of Harvard, right? We don't think of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, an alternative school for that matter. But it's the one thing you'll look over to in your life. You know, I flipped the script there. We, it's one thing you ever look, but it's the one thing you'll look over to as a sense of purpose that you've actually done something in your life that was purposeful to help others. Again, that service above self. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, Durfee. Um, how many how many uh, parents did you say were didn't they have a high school education or a, an approximate percentage number of parents that don't have a high school diploma? Sure, I'd say easily seventy percent. So, at seven out of ten students who come here are their parents don't are, aren't educated. Um, my idea actually came from LeBron James School in Ohio when I heard of that five years ago. That now he just offers the GED at their school. Um, and we do offer that through uh, the Connection Center at Gateway. But I think it's more important when you're working with students with poverty to get that culture built that their parents value education um, at the same school is just phenomenal. Um, and, and, you know, they, Senate Bill 63 just passed in Kentucky which allows that to happen, that adults can go to a virtual high school. Um, but we would, we're also gonna provide lab time for one-on-one -on -one work with their parents. There's a fee that they have to pay, but it's minimal um, compared to uh, getting their GED. 
Yes, ma'am. Sure. So we we put the yeah the 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 question was what does the restorative practice look like um, when you're talking about punitive um, if a kid seems disengaged in class his heads down for example um, punitive you know the teacher can say uh, an example that you know get out of the room go to the principal's office okay restorative is um, we ask we have a script that the old students go by. Um, we ask them, are you present? Um, so I'd ask you, are you present right now? And if the kid's head's down or he's screwing off or cussing or whatever, he would say, uh, they know to say, no, I'm not present. And then we ask him, can you fix it? And they'll say yes or no. And then based on that answer, you know, we have a focus room that we work through a contract through. And if they have offended somebody, then they have to restore it. I mean, have you ever heard of a high school where two students get in a physical fight and they're not sent home and suspended for several days. You know, at our school, we 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 have a we have a, a restorative circle where we circle up and we resolve the conflict there. So it's it's uh, that's a that's probably more of a better example. Of just putting your head down. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, that is a passion of mine. Yep. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Students come to the alternative school. Do they stay there until they graduate? Are there phases when they go back to the original? Sure. So it's a it's it's a it's a conundrum. They're unsuccessful in a system of education, and they're sent to an alternative school that does not mimic the traditional educational system. And we've made them successful in the non-traditional format. And then we seek to send them back to the format that they weren't successful at. So that is a, pro that is a problem of practice um, that we, that all alternative schools have been working towards on making those transitions smoother and more efficient. It's just that these students take so much work, hard work, um, that uh, it's not as simple as just sending them back. So what we typically do with juniors and seniors, we'll have a graduation. Um, they go through an orientation class with us where we teach them essential life skills and things like that for six weeks. I mean, you're talking about cooking, doing laundry, um, how to communicate with other people, how to resolve conflict, how to manage your own anger, things like that. And then uh, when they graduate their junior and senior, we'll, we either get them uh, formalized internships according to their work interests. Um, so they'll be coming to school half day and then go into their job half the day, or we get them connected to um, Gateway and their myriad of programming there, or also the Northern Kentucky Home Builders Association. So we've had students that have become firefighters and, and things like that. Yes, hi. Sure. Rise is essentially we rise. We rise above the traumas, the struggles in our life. This the saying that um, strong breezes make strong trees, right? Um, and that's what we teach them about our students. Um, ACE was just stood for you know the Alternative Center of Education, and you know I had the discussion with the sheriff um, because when our students would get in trouble sometimes with the law, um, they would publish that and say, these students who attended ACE did such and such and such and such and such. And again, it's that punitive mindset. Um, how are we ever going to you know, change a culture like that? Um, so we rise above those things. Um, we uh, asked, the students at our school and also the students here in the marketing department here to help us come up with a name. 
And so, uh, and that's and that's the saying that we've uh, been able to coin. Thank you. An overused word today is passion. In Dr. Hibbett, we love your passion and keep up the good work. Adam Howard would like to speak a few words about our first responders lunch. I, I just got a text message from my bride. She says that my sixth grader, uh, the gray middle school principal called. My sixth grader is in the uh, office at the gray middle school, just hearing everything that I just heard. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> she got an award. So no worries. Um, so next week, uh, we're gonna be delivering lunches first responders. Um, Donald Aaron has facilitated this in the past, and I think he is on, I'm not sure that I see him here, and I'm not sure if we can have him speak. Um, we will have lunches. How many of you have delivered lunches to um, law enforcement in the past? Okay, great. Everybody, get out your calendars, because next week we're going to be doing it again. Um, there will be a, an email. I'm not sure if the link has, was in the newsletter. Um, if it wasn't, well, regardless, if it wasn't, you're gonna get an email this week. That email is gonna encourage you to sign up for uh, delivering lunches. We'll be delivering lunches to the three law enforcement agencies in Boone County. We're gonna be delivering them to all three shifts and we're gonna be doing that over two days. So we need a minimum of one person per shift to go pick up the lunches from Colonial Cottage and then deliver them. Um, if I recall correctly, I think it's like seven o'clock in the morning for the box lunches, three o'clock in the afternoon. And I can't remember the exact time. It's either 7 p.m. at night or 9 p.m. at night. But basically, a lot of you have done this before. It's a great way to be able to say thank you to the men and women who are working for law enforcement in our community. Um, any questions about this? I think it's something we've done before and, and you should know about it, but any questions about this? All right, thank you. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> Couple birthdays this week. Sean, happy 39th birthday. He does have a pad that, you know, like, I guess he's got, got a couple of them. They're, they're about maybe an inch and a half. And thick. we have a few anniversaries. Janet, so he does have something like that. Three years. that. Yeah, there's a couple, pa pa couple of pads that we put on top. So welcome. We appreciate you guys, your longevity with the club. Then the clay shoot is coming up January, or excuse me, June 12th. Everything seems to be in order, looking for a great event. This is gonna be a great fundraiser for our foundation. We do need some additional sponsors and some shooters. So uh, get out your the old shotgun and uh, bring it on down the Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's range down in Crittenden. Our quarterly partners are Mary Rose and Tattoo Removal Inc. We appreciate all the donations to those organization. And lastly, there's always ways to support a club, whether that's through Kroger's, getting your Kroger card, linking it to Rotary, as well as Amazon. And our next week, it's gonna be our scholarship, pro our uh, recipients. This is always a great program. It's good to see the young kids and we appreciate everybody being here. We had a great crowd today. Hopefully everybody's getting their COVID shot and getting back to normal. Again, we appreciate you being here and look forward to next week. Thank you.